Yep. So the committee reports progress. Questions without notice. Senator Sherry. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to Senator Scullion, representing the Minister for Families, <coughs> Community Services and Indigenous Affairs. Is the minister aware that recent interest rate hikes are <coughs> one of the key reasons why young Australians can no longer afford to buy a home? Didn't the government promise in the 2004 election campaign that it would, quote, keep interest rates at record lows? Isn't this promise still on the Liberal Party <coughs> website, even today, as part of an election advertisement titled Economic Journey? Can the minister confirm that instead of being at record lows, interest rates have gone up five times in a row since the election, adding $260 a month to repayments on a $300,000 mortgage? Can the minister explain how a government breaking its promise on interest rates five times over helps young families to buy a home? Senator Scullion. Uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Mr. President, uh, I thank the, 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 uh, uh, the Senator for his question. Uh, again, I'm always a, a little stunned when uh, Labor came, uh, come to this place uh, lecturing us on, on interest rates, uh, uh, Mr. President. Perhaps, uh, perhaps uh, just, just for the record, just, just, just for clarity, uh, Mr. President, um, in terms of a, uh, of, uh, I, I would have thought those asking the question would have been interested in the answer, Mr. President. Um, just in terms of a record, Mr. President, uh, currently uh, um, uh, we are the, the interest rates today are at the highest under under the how it has ever been at 8.3. Can I just say that? Listen, just for the record, Mr. President, the best they ever achieved, the lowest they ever achieved, was 8.75 per cent. So, so, so. The highest they've ever been under us still it hasn't been anywhere near as as, as uh, low as they've been under those opposite, Mr. Mr. President. Well, well, they are record lows. Uh, they are rec oh, They are indeed record lows. They're far beneath what uh, what uh, they were Order. under Labor. They are indeed far below what they were under Labor. And of course, uh, the fundamentals about the, about interest rates, uh, Mr. President, is all about how we run the economy. And I know that most Australians won't need a reminder that when interest rates were running at 17.5 per cent under Labor. If you can only imagine that the tension one feels around 8 per cent now, how bad it would feel under Labor under 17 per cent, Mr. Uh, Mr. President. Uh, and of course, uh, Mr. President, they talk about housing affordability and they talk about interest rates. It's very hard to buy a home, Mr. President, if you don't have a job. If you don't have a job, Mr. President. Again, <coughs> one of the single fundamentals today, um, unemployment is at 4.3 per cent. Uh, under the other side, of course, uh, it was well over 10 per cent. Now, Mr. President, uh, it's okay sort of to talk about about uh, how people feel the pain, and no doubt people do. It is a very difficult uh, process in terms of buying buying your home, particularly in your your your, your, your home loan. And uh, of course, interest rates has a has a part to play in that. But as you know, Mr. President, I've said many times in this process that there are many other aspects uh, that can be controlled, and they, of course, can be controlled by the states and territories. They are, of course, Mr. President. Uh, stamp duty, there are land tax, uh, there are a whole range of other taxes, Mr. President, that have been foisted on the Australian public and have been referred to in this place certainly as a housing affordability tax, Mr. President. And of course, of course Mr. President, when we're talking about, about the economy, Mr. President, when we're talking about the, the economy, there's a whole suite of other, other reasons why people should look to the choice of the coalition Labor in the next election. Not only do we provide people with a job, we are not only provided with a job, Mr. President. We provide them with the jobs under us that have had wage, wage increases, real increases of 22 per cent. 22 per cent, Mr. Mr. Uh, Mr. President. Uh, uh, and, and there's some interjections from the other side about, uh, well, what did they do? Uh, Mr. President uh, went down by 1.7 per cent. 1.7 per cent drop in, in, in real wages, rather than the 22 per cent growth in real wages. And of course, uh, Mr. President. A lot of it's about confidence in the future, Mr. President. Confidence in the future, and I can tell you, someone who's buying a home today that has a job can be very confident about keeping that job. And under workplace choices, Mr. President, those on the other side continue to bring up, and I'm very pleased about that, 378,000 new jobs since uh, since work choices, 387,000 new families who can now afford to buy their own home. 
Order. Supplementary question, Senator Sherry. Thank you, Mr. President. Well, I do thank the minister for admitting uh, that interest rates today are higher than they've ever been under his government. But that just goes back to the original question: What happened to the promise to keep interest rates at record lows that your government made uh, three years ago? What happened to that promise? If interest rates are at record highs today, and after nine interest rate hikes in a row which have added $457 a month to a $300,000 mortgage, how will our kids ever be able to afford to buy their own home after your broken promise? Senator Sherry, I'd remind you to address your question through the chair. Senator Scullion. Uh, Mr President, again I'll reiterate the, uh, the circumstances that the government find themselves in. We find ourselves in a better position a better position than you would ever be under the Labor government, Mr. President. There is no doubt about that, and uh, we will continue to ensure that we run a fantastic economy so people have the best chance ever of having a job, the best chance ever of having an increase in, in, in wages, the best chance ever of having the lowest interest rates if you take the choice between the governments. And we will ensure that people who are buying the first home or need to buy another home are best looked after by, by running once again the greatest economy in the free world. Senator Nash, Thank order, you. order, order. Senator Nash. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the minister representing the minister for agriculture, fisheries and forestry, Senator Erica Betts. Will the minister update the Senate on the current drought situation? How is the Howard government acting to alleviate the serious problems this drought is creating, and is the minister aware of any alternative policies? Senator Betts. Thank you, Mr. President. I thank Senator Nash, that uh, very effective advocate for the rural communities of this country, for her question. Mr. President, Australia is facing extremely difficult times with the continuing drought. The drought is taking a huge toll on rural and regional Australia. If we don't get good rain soon, the winter crops are expected to fail. This will have a devastating effect on our primary producers. This coalition government has and continues to work with the Australian farming sector to get through these tough times. Since 2001, this government has committed over $2.4 billion to drought assistance. And Mr President, today the Prime Minister announced an additional $430 million in new funding for drought-affected farmers. I'm sure an announcement that Senator Nash uh, is very pleased about. This includes extending exceptional circumstances funding until September next year for 38 drought-declared areas in South Australia and setting aside extra money for parts of Tasmania and Western Australia. Mr President, all this is only possible because of the strong economic management of this government. If we hadn't brought the budget into balance, if we hadn't paid off Labor's $96 billion in debt, freeing up billions of dollars which were previously being used just to cover the interest on Labor's debt, how could we afford to support our farmers through these tough times? And of course, the answer is very simple. We couldn't. This, Mr. President, is the real human dividend for good economic management. And as Labor's record shows, and that of the state Labor governments confirms, you simply can't trust Labor with money. Mr. President, on top of all that, Labor continues to play politics with our $10 billion plan to secure the future of the Murray Darling River system and to secure the future of the farmers who rely on this river for their livelihood. The Howard government's $10 billion national plan for water security would put more water back into the system by piping and lining leaky irrigation channels. However, the Victorian state Labor government continues to play politics with this plan. And while Premier Brumby and the Victorian state Labor government stand in the way of a workable solution for Australia's <laughs> water situation, Mr Rudd fully endorses this inaction. Mr Rudd pretends he's serious about addressing the looming crisis in the Murray. He pretends that he supports the National Plan for Water Security, and he tells us that if only a Labor PM was elected, relationships with the states would be just dandy. But what has he done 
to get the Victorian Labor Premier to sign onto the plan. Nothing. Absolutely nothing. <clears throat> and indeed, the silence of those opposite confirms that. Mr Rudd is content to let Mr Brumby play politics with a plan rather than act in the national interest. When it comes to Mr Rudd, what this demonstrates is this. Look not at what Labor says, but look at what Labor does, whereas Senator Nash and her constituents and other Australians can actually say that the Howard Coalition government matches its words with actions in support of those that are doing it very tough in our rural communities because of the drought. Senator, Senator Hurley. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to, to Senator Scullion, representing the Minister for Families, Community Services and Indigenous Affairs. Is the minister aware that since the 2004 election, working families now spend 36 per cent more on childcare, 18 per cent more on bread, 29 per cent more on fresh fruit and vegetables, 15 per cent more on health care and 28 per cent more on petrol? On top of these cost of living increases, aren't homeowners with a $300,000 mortgage now $457 a month worse off? thanks to nine interest rate rises in a row. How can families plan their budgets when the cost of living just keeps going up? Given that the cost of living for families just keeps going up, can the minister indicate if he supports the Prime Minister's view that working families have never been better off? Order. Order on my right. Order. Senator Scullion. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, it, it's amazing uh, that we've just heard uh, um, uh, through the question. The inference was, of course, that uh, uh, having un unemployment rates uh, instead of being 10.9 per cent as they peaked under Labor now 4.3 per cent is somehow bad. Right. Somehow bad. And in real terms, if real terms, I can say when we came to office, when we came to office, to now, to June of 2007. There's 2,184,000 people today have a job that didn't have one then. That's 2,184,000 people who can now go out and buy, have a job, go and buy a house. They have a job today that they didn't have then. Order. They're going to... Order. Senator Scullion. Uh, thank you. And, and perhaps, uh, I know you'll understand it in this place, we talk, we talk about 10 per cent uh, 10 per cent unemployed, over 10 per cent unemployed. So when we came to government, there was 45 federal electorates with more than 10 per cent of the people didn't have a job, didn't have a job. And uh, of course now, now, Mr. President, there are no federal electorates under which we have 10 per cent of people unemployed. So we're very proud of that. We're very proud of that. Uh, and, I, and I have to say that, uh, uh, that the capacity to give to give people jobs is not only it, looking at our past record, of course, in terms of housing affordability, we have a plan for the future. On the 26th of July in 2007, Mr. President, the Australian Order. government announced that we would be inviting expressions of interest from state and territory governments, from the non-government sector and the private sector for their proposals <coughs> and their ideas of new and innovative approaches to using the available houses, the available funding to house, uh, to fund increasing housing supply. Now, they've had several proposals have been put forward recently to seek to increase the supply of affordable residential land and housing stock, uh, Mr. President. So these are innovative processes that are actually engaged by the organisations we know are going to deliver, Mr. President. We're very interested in examining the proposals as part of our increasing social housing supply request and information processes. Now, this government has consistently called on the state and territory governments to manage the provision of a range of housing options to Australians, specifically to increase the available and affording affordable land and housing, Mr President. Now, despite almost a billion dollars a year, Mr President, in investing in other places with other organisations, principally the uh, state and territory uh, uh, la Labor parties, we have managed to go backwards in terms of, of, of housing. And it's all right in this place, Mr President, to look at, at people who are buying houses and the interest rates, but the people uh, who surround me on this side the information I get to them, the people are also concerned with issues of rental, 
and we need to have a comprehensive policy statement that deals, deals with these issues across the board. So instead of, instead of providing a billion dollars a year, Mr. President, for 10 years, so that's 9.6 billion over 10 years, Mr. President, we haven't got a single extra house. We haven't got a single extra house. And the only failure in that policy by this government, Mr. President, was to trust state and territory Labor governments, Mr. President. That was our failure. And I can tell you, this is not a government uh, that continues to do the same thing and expects a different outcome, Mr. Mr. President, which is why we are looking at alternative policies and engaging in alternative partnerships arrangements to ensure that Australians buying their first home or, in fact, are in the rental market are getting the very best deal they can. Supplementary question, Senator Hurley. Thank you, Mr. President. How does the minister's vague, wandering answer help working families who are struggling with huge mortgages and rents and spiralling petrol, childcare, and grocery prices? Order, order on my right. Is order. the minister? Is the minister really so out of touch that he agrees with the prime minister, who says that working families have never been so well off? Senator Scullion. Uh, Mr President, I, had I attempted to answer, I think that was the childcare, the vegetables, the affordability and interest rates all in the one question. I don't really think it would have been as useful as, as sticking to the central point of, of, of the question. Mr President, the, the fundamental point was, was, was uh, the capacity for individuals to continue to pay off the mortgages. That was the fundamental point of the question. And perhaps what we can look to is the Reserve Bank uh, that, that have stated that around a quarter of owner occupiers are more than a year ahead in their scheduled payments. A year ahead in their schedule. It's just fact. I'm not making any subjective point about that or how Australians are doing. We, I acknowledge that it is difficult from time to time uh, uh, for many for many demographics, as it has been historically when you're buying your first home. That's the whole thing about your first home. Yes, it can be difficult. Uh, but it's tremendous to see that the uh, Reserve Bank actually estimates, factually estimates, less than 1 per cent of all home borrower households are more than 90, 90 days behind in their repayments. And I think that's a record Order, we Minister, be your proud. time has expired. Senator Adams. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Health and Ageing, Senator Ellison. Will the Minister advise the Senate of new initiatives to deliver hospital based training? For enrolled Australian nurses. Se Senator Ellison. Uh, thank you, Mr. President, and I thank Senator Adams for what is a very important question uh, to the public of Australia, and uh, acknowledge Senator Adams' uh, great interest in this area, particularly in the home state of Western Australia. Mr. President, uh, the Prime Minister has announced that uh, we will provide funding of $170 million uh, to create 25 Australian hospital nursing schools to deliver hospital-based training for enrolled nurses in both public and private hospitals. And it's important to remember that we are covering both public and private hospitals with this announcement. Uh, we see this as a partnership between both those sectors and a step forward in providing uh, additional nurses and providing the incentives for people to take up a nursing career. Can I say that uh, in, in relation to this initiative, students will receive practical on-site training at our hospitals uh, and will achieve nationally uh, accredited uh, qualifications in the diploma or advanced diploma level. Mr President, uh, selected hospitals will receive infrastructure funding from the Australian Government uh, for educational facilities to be developed, and we will provide four training staff for those participating hospitals. The first intake is expected to be in 2008, and uh, we envisage around about 500 additional enrolled nurses taking this up. Uh, they, there are a number of incentives that I mentioned. Uh, firstly, participating hospitals will pay trainee salaries until they attain their qualifications. The Australian government will provide wage subsidies to hospital nursing schools for each student for the first three months of $500 a week to assist the schools to provide their students with a wage. As well as that, the Australian government will pay the hospital nursing schools a $1,500 commencement fee or bonus and uh, an additional $2,500 on the completion uh, for each student. In addition to these payments uh, to the hospital nursing schools, the Australian government will directly pay each student 
a tax-free bonus of $2,000 once they have successfully uh, completed their first six months of the course, and a further tax-free bonus of $3,000 when they have successfully completed the whole of the course. Mr. President, these are tangible incentives to get more people into nursing, and I might add this is uh, in addition to the university-based system that we have. In fact, since 2005, under the Howard government, we have seen a further 3,700 additional nursing training places at universities, and that's, that, and that's going to grow to 10,000 by the year 2012. So what we have here is an initiative which builds on the existing uh, university-based training that we have and will provide practical hospital-based training. We are desperately short of nurses in this country, Mr. President, and this will act to remedy that. And it's been recognised widely. In fact, uh, a statement I see put out uh, on the September the 15th by the Australian Nursing Federation in Western Australia welcomes this plan. It welcomes this plan, as do other people involved in the nursing profession in this country. This is a very good initiative which spells good news for the administration of health care in this country. Senator Wong. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to Senator Abetz, the minister representing the Minister for Employment and Workplace Relations. And I refer the minister to the letter to Australian nurses from Mr Hockey, published in newspapers across the nation at the weekend. Can the minister confirm that this full-page advertisement was paid for by Australian taxpayers, not by the Liberal Party? And will the minister now come clean on the full cost of this latest advertising campaign? Can the minister tell Australian taxpayers, who have already footed the bill for $93 million worth of Howard Government Work Choices advertising, just how many more advertisements from Mr Hockey the Howard, government's, Howard Government expects taxpayers to pay for? <coughs> Senator Betts. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, as I think more and more Australians are coming to realise, the misinformation campaigns run by the ACTU and aided and abetted by the Australian Labor Party has caused a great degree of confusion within the minds of the Australian public. And therefore, Mr. President, it is appropriate, it is appropriate for us as a government to put the facts on the record. And the facts are these, Mr. President. The Australian public has been provided with misinformation and misleading uh, commentary about, the, about how the pain conditions of Australia's nurses are set. Advertising was placed in the national newspapers on the weekend to clarify the situation with Australia's nurses so that they know where they stand. The Australian Institute of Health and Welfare publication titled Nursing and Midwifery Labor Force 2004 shows that around two thirds of nurses are employed in the public sector. Two thirds of nurses employed in the public sector. These nurses have their pay and conditions set by state Labor governments. Two thirds by state Labor governments. And yet the ACTU and the Nurses' Union and other organisations deliberately mislead the Australian people in relation to that. The publication also shows that around 14 per cent of all nurses are residential aged care nurses. The majority of residential aged care nurses, around three quarters, are employed in the private sector. Nurses working under the Federal Workplace Relations System have the protection of the fairness test when negotiating AWAs so that penalty rates and overtime cannot be exchanged without fair compensation. All employees in the federal system have a set of protections which all employers must abide by. Now, Mr President, in relation to government advertising generally, can I make this point? State Labor governments around Australia have in fact outspent that which we, as an Australian government, spend in communications campaigns. Do you ever hear one word of criticism from Mr Rudd about 
state Labor advertising. Never once. Never once. When Mr Beattie's watermelon smiling face appeared in all the national newspapers promoting how well he was running Queensland, despite of Dr Death and other issues, that Queensland taxpayer funded those advertisements, and guess what? Not a squeak, not a squeak from the former Mandarin of the Queensland government, one Mr Rudd. Now what that's showing is, Mr President, is that this Mandarin is fast turning into a lemon. Because what Order. he's not able to do Order is to on deliver on his policy with his state Labor colleagues. And so he says he's going to cooperate with his state Labor colleagues. You know what that means, don't you? Huge advertising expenditure, way and beyond that which has ever been seen. In relation to nurses, Mr President, the feedback we have got is that a lot of nurses now feel very satisfied that the misinformation being put out by the Nurses' Federation has simply been a political ploy to damage the government and not within the interest of nurses at heart. Supplementary questions? Senator Thank you, Wong. Mr. President. I note the minister asserts that it is appropriate for Mr. Hockey to use taxpayer fund to advertise his open letter. I note the minister again refused to come clean with Australian taxpayers and tell them how much they are spending on this latest round of advertising. Why don't you answer the question, Minister? Can, can uh, the minister Senator also Wong, confirm order. through Senator you, Wong. Mr. No, President? Not through me, to me. Through you, Mr President, the minister could come clean with Australian taxpayers and tell them just how much they are spending on Mr Hockey's latest round of industrial relations advertising. Minister, can the minister also confirm that the Howard government is on track to spend nearly $2 billion, $2 billion of taxpayers' fund on advertising during its term in office? Minister, isn't it the case? that the Howard government will do anything, say anything and spend any amount of taxpayers' money in an attempt to get itself re-elected. Sen Senator Betts. Uh, thank you, Mr President. As the honourable senator well knows, 25 per cent of government communications is spent on what? Defence force recruitment. Defence force recruitment. Would the Labor Party abolish that? Absolutely not. Would they abolish the advertising that communicates with people about their rights and responsibilities in relation to, let's say, drugs? Would they do that? No, they wouldn't. So what they say, very dishonestly to the Australian people, we're against all the advertising, but when you start putting them down campaign by campaign, the only one they don't like is Order. work choices. And the reason they can afford to do that is Order. because the ACTU is outspending the taxpayers in relation to their misinformation campaign. And the Labor Party seeks to surf into government on the top of this wave of misinformation and we have a duty to the Australian people to correct the record, and that is what we are doing. Order. Order. I remind senators that yelling across the chamber is disorderly. Senator Trude. Thank you, Mr President. Mr President, my question is to my distinguished colleague from Queensland, Senator Brandis, and it is his capacity as the minister for representing the Minister for Vocational and Further Education. Will the minister inform the Senate of the steps the Howard government is taking to address Australia's skill shortages? Is the minister aware of any alternative policies? Senator Brandis. Thank you, Mr. President. Order, Thank you. Senator Evans. Order. Order. Senator Brandis. Thank you, Mr President. Yes, I'm delighted to be able to inform Senator Trude what the government is doing in relation to the skills shortage. But can I preface my remarks by saying, Mr President, a skills shortage is a problem, but it is a problem that has a particular cause, and the particular cause of the, of the skills shortage is because unemployment in this country is so low at the moment, and therefore the labour market is so tight. Unemployment, might I remind you, Mr President, in Australia at the moment is 4.3 per cent. When the government came into office in March of 1996, unemployment was 8.2 per cent, having peaked at 11 per cent under the Hawke and Keating Labor governments. But unemployment today is at a 33-year low, 
There are more people in work than there have ever been before in this country, and what's more, unemployment has, for, has been below 5 per cent ever since May of 2006 and trending downward. So, Senator Trude, that's why we have a skills shortage. And I want to tell you, Senator Trude, for you, Mr. President, what the government is doing about it. But might I perhaps reverse the order of your question and tell you, first of all, what I know about alternative policies? Because, Mr. President, the ALP does have an alternative policy to those of the government to deal with the skills shortage. It was announced by Mr. Kevin Rudd on the weekend. You know what it is, Mr. President, to set up a task force to look at it. To set up a task force to look at it. Now, Mr. President, this seems to be the Labor Party prescription. I've been going through the Labor Party's policy announcement as to across the whole gamut of public policy. And can I tell you, Mr. President, that so far the Australian Labor Party has committed to establishing 91 reviews, 41 new agencies, 17 new boards and panels, 18 new task forces. Five parliamentary. It's a bit like that, that Christmas carol of the, of, the, of the partridge in the pear tree. Five parliamentary inquiries and two summits, and we are counting. So that's why what we know about the alternative policies of the Australian Labor Party: government by conversation, government by talk fest. We know that Mr Rudd can speak fluently under wet cement in two languages, but he never gets anywhere. All he does is he refers matters to yet another policy review, task force, agency, summit or parliamentary inquiry. Now, Mr President, by contrast, the Howard government has undertaken specific real measures, real measures to address the problem of the skill shortage created by the tight labour market, the consequence of the high levels of full employment. Order, Senator Brandis. Which we have resume your seat, Senator Australia. Brandis. Resume your seat. Order. There is far too much yelling across the chamber. I would ask the Senate to come to order. 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 Senator Brandis. Thank you, Mr. President. And if I, there are so many of these measures, Mr. President. Perhaps the Senator Trude might need to ask me a supplementary yeah, yeah. question, so I can get through them. But the Howard government has established 28 Australian technical colleges in 24 regions across Australia, provided a wage top-up of $1,000 per annum for two years for apprentices in skilled shortage trades provided $500 per annum for two years for training fees for apprentices in skilled shortage trades, extended fee help for people studying diplomas and advanced diplomas in the VET sector, provided up to $50,000 for trading organisations developing fast-track apprenticeships, established the Australian Institute for Trade Skills Excellence, offered a toolkit worth up to $800 to Australian apprentices in skills, needs and occupations. It's amazing to hear them, not the toolkit, Mr President. Almost every last one of them is a union hack who has who's never worked with their hands in their life. But they serve in here, they serve in here Order. on the basis of state and trade union members like Senator Order, Conway your time over there from the trust. Senator Brandis. Order Senator Brandis. Order. 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 Senator Evans. Order. Order. Senator, Senator Evans. Order. Order. We will not proceed until the Senate comes to order. Senator Campbell. Senator Trude. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, I must say I am very deeply alarmed to learn that the, um, the, that the only response that the Australian Labor Party seems to be able to offer to the matter of skills shortages in this country is to set up yet another committee. And I was wondering, Mr. President, whether the minister would be good enough to expand on the very substantive issues to which he was referring in relation to the Howard government's record. Senator Br Listen, Senator I'll Brandis. go on. I was interrupted by the baying contempt by the trade union officials there for people who actually use toolkits. 
As well, Senator Trude will provide employer incentives of $4,000 per apprentice, establish a $13,000 wage subsidy for mature age apprentices. We've created work skills vouchers up to $3,000 for individuals aged 25 years or over who don't have year 12 or equivalent qualifications. Created business skills training vouchers of up to $500 for apprentices. Provided an additional 5,000 places in the access program which assist job seekers experiencing barriers to skilled employment to obtain and maintain an Australian apprenticeship. Provide up to, provided up to 4,500 free vocational training places in the trades through group training arrangements. Work in partnership with group training organisations to provide an additional 7,000 Australian school-based apprenticeships and increased funding for the Australian Apprenticeship Centres Order. to allow them to intervene the time has expired, during apprenticeships. Senator, the time has expired. Senator Bob Brown. Thank you, uh, President. My question goes to the Minister representing the Prime Minister. I draw his attention to my statement to this House on 4 February 2003 regarding the Iraq War that this is not Australia's war, this is an oil war. This is the United States recognising that as an economic empire of the age it needs oil to maintain its preeminence. And the Prime Minister's statement uh, of the same day saying no criticism is more outrageous than the claim that the US behaviour is driven by a wish to take control of Iraq's oil reserves. I ask the Minister, in view of Alan Greenspan, former chairman of the US Federal Reserve's um, point of view revealed today that what everyone knows the Iraq War is largely about oil. Why did Prime Minister Howard mislead this nation? How could he have gotten it so wrong? And will he now face up to the fact that he led, he came behind George Bush to invade Iraq for reasons of oil, and not the other reasons spuriously put forward? Order, Senator Minchin. Uh, Mr President, um, I noticed uh, press reports of Mr Greenspan's alleged comments, and I'm not going to suggest that he didn't say that, but I've not read all those comments. Uh, I'd only say that uh, while he's regarded, I think, highly internationally uh, for his record as the US's central banker, uh, I don't know that he has such a reputation with respect to strategic issues confronting of the world and the war on terrorism. I don't think that is his expertise. I'm frankly rather surprised by the reports of him suggesting that the Iraq war was all about oil. Uh, from the Australian government's point of view, and I'm sure the US government's point of view, we totally and utterly reject the suggestion uh, that uh, the uh, effort to uh, liberate the Iraqi people uh, and to ensure that the UN position with respect to Iraq was indeed put into effect uh, had anything to do with oil. And indeed, one could go so far as to suggest if, that if what, was worried about, if what one was worried about was oil supplies from Iraq, the last thing you would do would be to invade that country. You'd have done some sort of deal uh, with um, the former dictator of that country. That would have been utterly uh, naive and idiotic to do what we've done. Um, so, Mr uh, President, if I could go back to um, uh, the primary position that Senator Brown is putting to us that uh, we should never have participated in the US um, action with respect to Iraq. I would remind um, Senator Brown of the circumstances of that action. For years we had had um, the dictator of Iraq thumbing his nose at the UN with respect to sanctions imposed on that country by the UN as a result of that country's invasion of Kuwait. Uh, the dictator of Iraq invaded its peaceful neighbour, Kuwait, uh, and as a result of that invasion there was a UN action to repel Iraq, to repel Saddam Hussein and restore peace and liberty to the people of Kuwait. As a result of that, sanctions were imposed by the UN uh, on Iraq and a regime imposed which required inspection of military facilities and weapons facilities in Iraq to ensure that Iraq was not in a position to develop weapons of mass destruction. The Iraqi government under Saddam Hussein expelled the UN, refused to comply with the UN, refused to allow inspection of those facilities um, and thumbed its nose at the UN. 
such that even the leader of the, op the now leader of the opposition, uh, Mr. Kevin Rudd, accepted that in all likelihood there were weapons of mass destruction being developed by the Hussein government. It was reasonable for the world to assume that the behaviour of Saddam Hussein was consistent with him developing weapons of mass destruction. And therefore, tragically, the UN could not bring itself to enforce its own sanctions. The great tragedy in all of this is that the UN regrettably was incapable of enforcing the sanctions that it had imposed and enforcing its rule on the dictator of Iraq. And as a result, the US decided to lead a coalition to impose those sanctions and enforce the will of the UN upon Iraq. Now, it was one of the most difficult decisions this government has ever had to make. Uh, I was a member of the cabinet which made that decision, and it's probably the most difficult decision that I've participated in. Uh, the cabinet members knew it would be controversial and people like Senator Brown would oppose it. We continue to believe we did the right thing. We continue to believe that we acted properly and in good faith and in Australia's national interests. And, Mr President, it had nothing to do with oil. Supplementary question, Senator Brown. Good question. Well, Dr Greenspan says it was largely about oil. How could the government have gotten it so wrong? And I ask, uh, flowing from that, with the Prime Minister making clear that 20 per cent of crude oil comes from the Middle East, what is the government's preparation for this nation as peak oil approaches? Senator, Senator Minchin. Uh, well, Mr President, I'm not sure that a discussion about peak oil, which could take uh, at least um, several answers, has anything to do with the rest of that question. All I'd say is that, with great respect to Mr Greenspan, a, a gentleman who I do respect for his record as the US um, Federal Reserve Governor, uh, he is completely wrong on the issue of the motivation uh, for the action that was taken in Iraq. We continue to believe that what we did with respect to Iraq was right, that our presence there is right, and that what we have done is to bring liberty to the people of Iraq and ensure that the dictator of Iraq could not develop weapons of mass destruction to imperil <coughs> the free world. Senator Ronaldson. Oh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Mr. President, my question is to the Minister for Communications, Information Technology and the Arts, Senator Coonan. As the Minister was aware, the continuation of reliable mobile phone coverage is an extremely important issue for regional and rural Australians. Will the Minister please advise the Senator of any government action to protect those living and working in regional rural Australia from the potential? For a premature closure of the CDMA network before the next G network provides at least as Senator good Conroy. and services. Senator Kern. Uh, thank you, Mr. President, and uh, I do thank Senator Ronaldson for the question and uh, for his uh, for his interest in regional and rural telecommunication services, yeah. and in particular the important issue of the closure of the CDMA network. Uh, since announcing its intention to construct the next G network. Telstra, of course, uh, Mr. President, has given public assurances that the CDMA network will continue to operate until the next G network provides at least as good coverage and services. And, Mr. President, the government has heard loud and clear the concerns from regional Order. and rural Australia about the problems currently Order. being experienced with the Senator next Conroy. G network. And after hearing those concerns, I issued Telstra with a draft licence condition that would, if made, require Telstra to keep the CDMA network in operation until the next G network provided at least as good coverage and services. In accordance with the legislative requirements, Telstra were given 30 days to consider the draft licence condition. Disappointingly, however, uh, before I had a chance to fully consider Telstra's submission on the draft, they commenced Senator legal action Conroy. in an attempt to prevent a final decision being made to protect rural and regional Australians from the network being shut down until there was equivalent or better coverage. Now, this is a very important matter for rural and regional consumers, and they deserve better than to be left hanging while Telstra subjects them to a time-consuming, costly and pointless legal dispute. 
Accordingly, I authorised last week the Attorney General, the Honourable Philip Ruddock, to consider the matter and, if warranted, to make the decision in relation to the draft licence condition. I was today advised, uh, Mr. President, that the Attorney has in fact made the decision to vary the conditions on Telstra's carrier licence to protect users in the transition from CDMA to Next G. Importantly, it means that regional and rural Australians can be assured that the CDMA network will not be switched off until Telstra makes good its promise that the Next G network provides at least as good coverage and services. However, uh, Mr. President, uh, regional and rural Australians will be aware of the deafening silence that came from Mr. Rudd and the Labor Party in this most important matter that affects those in rural and regional Australia. Not even a task force, Senator Brandis. Senator Conroy. Not even an inquiry. Nothing. Deafening silence. So afraid were the Labor Party to interrupt their cosy little relationship with Telstra. Senator Coonan. Labor Senator Coonan, resume your seat. Yes. Senator Conroy, I have consistently asked you to stop interjecting. The, the Senate will come to order. Sen Senator Coonan. Thank you, Mr. President. I was in the course of saying that uh, so afraid were the Labor Party to interrupt their cosy little relationship with Telstra that they couldn't even raise a whimper of support for the protection of rural and regional Australians. Mr. Rudd and his union mates should stand condemned today for their abject failure to stand up for consumers around Australia when it comes to mobile phone coverage. In contrast, the government makes no apologies for putting consumers first when considering the regulation of Australia's telecommunications industry. The government understands that good mobile coverage is not an optional extra. It's vitally important, and people living in regional and rural Australia can be, can be absolutely assured that this government will continue to stand up for their interests and deliver them the services they need and want. Order. Order. Senator Stirl. Order. Senator, supplementary question. Thank Senator you, Mr. Rollins. President. Mr. President, uh, I refer the minister her uh, discussions about premature closure of networks. I uh, just wonder whether the minister can tell the Senate what the implications were of the uh, of the closure of the analog uh, uh, network uh, uh, by this government uh, following the uh, the inactivity of the uh, of the Australian Labor Party when last in government. Senator Senator Kernan. I thank um, I thank uh, Senator Ronaldson for the supplementary. Well, of course, uh, Mr. President, we all remember that uh, the Labor Party's seminal neglect of rural and regional Australia. Order. Oh, Qu point of order, Senator Conroy. I'd ask you to roll this order, question I, out of order. order. Wait, wait till I call you. I can't hear what you're saying. I'm going to rule this question out of order as this decision was actually made by Minister Ruddock because Senator Coonan had to embarrassingly pass it across for Minister Ruddock to make these decisions because of her own incompetence. Order. And the you question are now is out of order you and should be directed to the minister in the other chamber. You are now debating the issue. Uh, there is no point of order. Senator Coonan. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, well, Mr. Um, Mr. President, as those listening to this broadcast will know, the Labor Party has a long record of seminal neglect in looking after rural and regional Australia. They will not stand up for rural and regional Australians, whether it comes to delivering them broadband, delivering them mobile phones. We all know that the Labor Party is hand in glove with Telstra. They will ride roughshod over consumers in rural and regional Australia, and they will continue this neglect as long as it suits their interests, which is so long as the Labor Party is in cahoots with Telstra. Uh, order. Order. Your colleague wishes to ask a question. Senator Carr. Mr President, my question is to Senator Betts, Minister representing the Minister for the Environment and Water Resources. And I refer the Minister to the government's $23 million taxpayer-funded climate change advertising campaign. I'd ask, can the minister indicate whether the advertisements will tell Australians that under the Howard government, Australia is the second highest per capita greenhouse polluter in the world? Our emissions are projected to grow by a further 27 per cent by 2020. 
and Australia is one of the only two industrialised nations to have not ratified the Kyoto Protocol. If, if, if the government's climate change advertising campaign really about providing information, wouldn't it contain facts like these? Or is it instead just another propaganda campaign, more about cynical pre-election spin rather than providing factual information? Order on my right. Order. Order. Senator Betts. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, what do the Australian people want to learn through this information campaign, and that has come through very loud and clear to us as a government, because we actually consult with people when we go to our community uh, gatherings, when we talk with people. We get the understanding that all Australians are concerned about climate change and about the environment. And the question they want to know is not what all the Labor Party's rhetoric might be, but how can they personally make a difference? Personally make a difference. And that is why, for example, in the information that has gone out to households, we don't tell them that forestry, for example, is the only greenhouse positive sector of the economy, which would be an important fact from my point of view. But the people uh, of Australia want to know how they can best make a difference. And so that is what we are seeking to do in our uh, interaction with the Australian people through this campaign. It's about giving uh, Australians the information they have been seeking so that they can take action in their own homes. Australian households are responsible for around 20 per cent of Australia's greenhouse gas emissions, so action at this level, along with government and industry, can make a big impact. And of course, what this builds on, Mr uh, President, is the fact that Australia was the first government ever to establish a greenhouse office. It develops also on our mandatory renewable energy targets, the phase-out of inefficient light bulbs, our $200 million global initiative on forests and climate, the recent uh, Sydney Declaration, which achieved a genuine commitment from leaders within our region to move forward on climate change. And so, Mr. President, we could have incorporated all that sort of information in the, uh, in, in the communications with our fellow Australians, but they weren't really interested in all that. What they were interested in was how they could personally make a difference, and we have fulfilled that need by this particular communication. Supplementary question, Senator Thank Carr. You, Mr. President, I'd ask. Hasn't the government had 11 and a half years to respond to climate change? Why is it that after all of this time, the best the government can come up with is a $23 million pre-election propaganda campaign? Doesn't this confirm once and for all that this is a government full of climate change sceptics, like the minister himself, who are not serious about tackling climate change? And are only interested in getting re-elected. Senator Betts. How do you get that? Mr. President, if uh, Senator Carr was not interested in getting elected, he wouldn't be making such deliberately misleading statements to the Australian public. Because what Senator Carr knows is that when we came into government, immediately on coming into government, a predecessor minister for the environment in fact pursued the issue of whether or not Australia should get an Australian Greenhouse Office. And we established that in 1998, some nine years ago. And yet Senator Carr deliberately seeks to mislead the Australian people by asserting that we had not engaged on the issue of greenhouse gases and climate change until right now before an election. Yeah. Senator Carr better explain to the Australian people, Mr President, as to why, if, that, if his assertion is true, why we established the Australian Greenhouse Office nine years ago. The fact is, and I've pointed this out before, Mr President, of all the questions on climate change, the Coalition has Order. asked the most questions Order. since 1996 your time, your up until expired. the last 12 months. Um, Senator Allison. 
Uh, thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Veterans Affairs. And I ask, has the Minister seen the report of the UK study this week that shows that the veterans forced to watch British nuclear tests here in Australia uh, will pass on scrambled DNA and crippling health problems to families for 20 generations? Doesn't this make the government's health cards uh, for nuclear veterans look hopelessly inadequate? And will it now stop fighting these sick veterans in, uh, for compensation in the courts? And will the government now do a proper study of the families of Australian veterans and show more compassion than has been apparent so far? Um, Senator Ellison. Oh, thank you, Mr. President. And, uh, I, I am aware of the issue that uh, Senator Allison has mentioned. It is a serious issue. As to the report, uh, I haven't had a briefing on that, uh, and I will advise the Senate accordingly. In relation to the uh, health cards afforded to veterans, can I say that uh, uh, we have a variety of uh, health programs available to veterans, um, both the gold card and the white card, and uh, my own feedback from the veterans community has been a positive one in relation to the uh, health services that we provide veterans uh, in, this, in this country. And just recently, we made the announcement uh, in relation to the indexation of pensions yeah. or allowances, which went down very well. But as for the health aspect, can I say that uh, uh, we do have a good system in place and one which I think stands up very well internationally. So I fail to see how St Allison can impute that in some way we are we are uh, letting down the veterans uh, as a result of uh, in result as a result of any of the ill effects they might have suffered as a result of the testing concern. Supplementary question, Senator Allison. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank the minister for his answer. Um, but uh, uh, I ask him to confirm that even those white and gold cards offered to the veterans have been denied to numerous of them who've, re who've, uh, who've requested them. Uh, uh, and I go on to uh, ask if the minister is also aware about the UK study um, that the children and grandchildren of nuclear veterans uh, suffer limb deformities, tumours, heart, eye and hearing problems, epilepsy, autism, brain deformities, twisted spines, missing organs and extra fingers and toes, and a range of other rare conditions. Is he aware that the grandchildren are eight times more likely to inherit a defect and twice as likely to get childhood cancer? So why would the scrambled DNA found in British veterans not also be present in Australian veterans? Sen or order, Senator Ellison. Uh, well, Mr. Uh, Mr. President, if uh, Senator Ellison has any particular aspect of someone being refused a white card or a gold card uh, that she has some problem with, she should refer them to to the minister and myself, and I'll pass it on. But can I say that uh, in relation to the, the the medical requirements for that, they are they are laid out in the uh, uh, Veterans Entitlements Act 1996, and uh, uh, we apply that criteria to anyone who applies for a, a white card or a gold card. Uh, as to the uh, United, uh, United Kingdom experience, we'll have a look at that and see what we can learn from it. But I've said earlier that uh, I don't have a briefing in relation to that report that Senator Allison has mentioned, and uh, I'll get back to the Senate with further details on that. Senator Conroy. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to Senator Coonan, the Minister for Communications, Information, Technology and the Arts. I refer to the letters the minister has sent to 500,000 Australians explaining that they have, and I quote, not received a commercial upgrade to enable access to ADSL or wireless broadband. Can the minister confirm that 3G is wireless broadband? Is the minister also aware of reports that Australians who have received her letter have been informed by her department's website that they already have access to ADSL broadband? And can the minister indicate whether she is, is continuing to mail her misleading letters to Australians? Will the minister now commit to reimburse taxpayers for the cost of the Liberal Party propaganda, which has misled the Australian public? Senator Kuna. Uh, thank you, Mr. President, and uh, thank you uh, to Senator Conroy for the question. It actually comes as absolutely no surprise. In fact, it's rather predictable from. Uh, a Labor Party who is nothing but a puppet and uh, is doing the bidding of uh, Telstra. Uh, we know, of course, that uh, Telstra and the Labor Party 
a hand in glove, as we've uh, found out from uh, documents produced in the last couple of days. Nevertheless, I'm more than happy to continue to respond to the same questions that are asked of me of both Labor and then of Telstra. So here we go. Telstra is complaining about a letter sent by my department to households that, according to data held by my department, cannot currently receive a metro comparable terrestrial broadband service such as ADSL. And the letter advises these residents of the government's Australia Connected initiative and the new Opel WiMAX and ADSL 2 Plus high-speed broadband network that will cover those particular households in the near future. It's something for them to look forward to, uh, Mr President. And it's entirely appropriate, I would have thought, to inform the constituents of government initiatives especially for a program of this nature, which involves $958 million of government funding to extend high-speed broadband to 99 per cent of the population at prices they can afford. And, uh, the recipients of the letters were persons based on data held by the department uh, to be considered not well served with an affordable metro comparable broadband service. So once again, Telstra True to Form has threatened action against the government, and I don't propose to comment any further on that order. particular point. Kernan, However, point of order, Senator. Point of order. Uh, could, uh, <laughs> its relevance. Could you draw the minister's attention to the question, which was, can the minister confirm that 3G is wireless broadband? That, that was that was the question, and can the minister indicate whether she is continuing to mail her misleading letters to Australians? And will she reimburse taxpayers? Order. Order. She's over halfway through a time to answer, and she hasn't addressed any of those questions. Order. The minister still has over two minutes of time remaining to answer the question. It was a question that was broader than you originally suggested. I call Senator Coonan. Yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. President. So, uh, as uh, uh, those matters go to uh, matters that are apparently going to be the subject. Of some, uh, of some legal action. I'm not going to uh, join issue with uh, Senator Conroy because I prefer to actually answer it where there is uh, an appropriate uh, place to do so. Now, Order. Um, Mr uh, President, what is interesting about Senator Conroy's question and the whole line of questioning uh, of the Labor Party when it comes to telecommunications matters uh, is the closeness between the Labor Party and Telstra. And it's because Telstra has realised that only under a Labor government will it be possible to retain its monopoly, destroy competition, wind back safeguards for consumers, support a twofold increase in both telephone and broadband prices. And, Mr President, the shame of the matter is is that Telstra has got the Labor Party where it wants it, a puppet on a string, prepared to do Telstra's bidding, regardless of how it will hurt consumers. Order. Supplementary question. Order. Order on my right. Order. 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 Senator Conroy, supplementary question. Thank, thank you, question. Mr. President. Can the minister explain why her media adviser, when asked about the mail out, claimed in the Australian newspaper on Friday, and I quote, there is now serious competition in the market providing choice for consumers? How can the minister write to Australians about their lack of access to broadband when <laughs> her own office admits that the Opel product creates competition in the market? Senator, Co Senator well, Kernan. Mr. Uh, <laughs> oh, oh, order, order, Senator Conroy. You've asked the question. Now wait for the answer, Senator Con. Uh, Senator Mr. Kernan. President, um, I hope that those listening to this broadcast understand that the Labor Party have got some fundamental uh, objection to choice for consumers. Yeah, yeah. What an extraordinary admission, that's Mr. Right, President. That's right. And it's clear that uh, Telstra doesn't like choice and doesn't like competition, and that Senator Conroy and Mr Rudd haven't got the bottle to stand up to Telstra, just like they can't stand up to the trade unions, they can't stand up to state Labor governments, and they're obviously going to not be able to stand up to consumers being ride, ridden roughshod in the bush. Um, Mr um, President, we will resist Telstra's sideshows, we'll resist Labor's sideshows, we'll continue to stand up for rural and regional Australians, 
uh, we will not be intimidated by this sideshow that's going on with court actions and questions in question time, and we will continue to roll Order. up the services that Order. consumers time need and want. Yeah. Your time is expired. Further questions be placed on the notice. Senator Ellison. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Mr. President, uh, uh, Senator Ludwig asked me some questions on uh, the Systems for People program in the Department of Immigration last Thursday, the 13th of September 2007. I undertook to get back with uh, further information. I now table that information and seek leave to incorporate it. Ms. Leave granted. There being no objection, leave is granted. Senator. Um, Senator Sherry, uh, sorry, Senator Carr, I Thank think you, you want to yes. call. Um, uh, Mr. President, pursuant to Standing Order 74.5, I would ask uh, the Minister representing the Minister for Education for an explanation as to why answers have not been provided to 145 questions on notice uh, from, from the Employment, Workplace, Relations and Education Committee, which were asked at the May budget estimates. I, now understand, I understand they're now seven weeks overdue. Senator Brandis. Mr. President, as I undertook to Senator Carr to do when he raised this matter for the first time on Thursday, I have received the matter with the Minister's office, and I have been provided by the Minister's office which, with the following explanation. As is usual practice in responding to questions on notice arising from, from the Senate estimates process, the Department is preparing responses for all senators, not just Senator Carr. <laughs> Those responses vary in length and complexity. It is frequently the case that responses are submitted to the Senate across the full time period between the estimate sittings, including up to the day of the next sitting. The responses continue to be prepared and will be submitted to the Senate as soon as they are available. So, uh, Senator Carr. I move to take note of the Minister's answer. Uh, Mr. Acting, uh, Mr. Mr. Deputy President, I have um, been seeking answers to questions, uh, 175 questions, uh, sorry, 145 questions, uh, of which I understand that 69, 69 were asked for myself, but there were 145 questions outstanding from this estimates committee. Now that's some um, 84% of the total number of questions that have been asked by this committee. At the, uh, at the May budget estimates. It uh, defies all possible credibility that the government can say that the failure to answer questions is on the basis that there is uh, opportunity for the government to answer these questions up until the first day of the next round of estimates. The date for the answering of questions was the 27th of July. It was the date set by this parliament, by this chamber, it was a date uh, that some nearly eight weeks now have been uh, passed. It is not exactly a stringent uh, timetable. You've been too uh, soft. Not, it wasn't You've a particularly stringent soft. timetable. Uh, of the 172 questions which were asked on the day of the estimates, not one question was answered on time. Not one question. There was, uh, as of uh, last Thursday, Three months after the hearings, 15 per cent had been answered. 145 or 84 per cent remain unanswered. And of course, to make matters worse, legitimate uh, inquiries uh, to the committee have been stonewalled, as, as we saw here today, yet again. The minister's representative here was asked to read out a highly contemptuous response by the minister's office. Committee staff seeking information are simply told that no timetable for answers can be provided, that all answers are being considered. And we ask a simple question, considered by whom? By the Minister's office? We all understand that we are uh, facing the prospect of an election. It is quite clear that this is a minister that does not want to have this parliament uh, receive answers to legitimate <coughs> questions taken by the department back in May. And of course this is not the first time that this has happened. There was one particular question, uh, E088, on the question of non-government school funding, which not only did I ask on the day and was uh, and, and it was advice given that the information be provided on the day, I asked again 
at the time of a consideration of a bill in this chamber, uh, some or nearly three months ago, and I've been told—I was told at the time by this minister at the table that every effort would be made to follow up that answer. I don't dispute his bona fides in this question. I don't dis dispute Minister Brandis's bona fides in this question. He did give an undertaking in good faith, but it's quite clear that Minister Bishop has a contemptuous attitude towards the Senate, to the Senate estimates uh, processes. If we look through the issues, these are straightforward questions. There is no issue here about complexity. What is abundantly clear is that the government is seeking to hide information. There is a situation where we are seeing the government floundering around the question of the Australian Technical Colleges, questions relating to the CSIRO's operations, its commercialisations, its IP royalties, questions relating to the government's latest attempts to conclude uh, its somewhat uh, tawdred to history in regard to the radioactive waste dump and many others. And the issue is whether or not the department's stalling for time, which I don't believe. I happen to think that this department has understood the importance of these questions, and over time and over a very lengthy period of time, I'm able to uh, say we've engaged constructively with this department. I'm therefore obliged to conclude that the problem here is with the minister and the contemptuous attitude that the minister has uh, about uh, responding to legitimate questions from the Senate. Now, either way it goes, whether it's the department or the minister, the Senate's entitled to these answers. And I would seek from the minister, representing the Minister of Education and Research, uh, that further efforts be made to encourage his colleague to answer these questions uh, before other motions have to be considered by this chamber. Senator Brandis. Well, um, Mr Deputy President, um, Senator Carr should not infer from anything that I have said that anyone is stalling. Um, what um, I have said on behalf of uh, Ms Bishop, whom I represent in this chamber, uh, is that um, the um, preparation of the answers um, is proceeding um, and that uh, many of the questions taken on notice are very complex questions. Uh, there are two obligations, not one. Senator Carr would have you believe that there is merely an obligation to respond in a timely fashion. There is, but there is also an obligation to um, respond accurately and thoroughly, and sometimes uh, a thorough and accurate response to questions taken on notice uh, will take some little while. And Senator Carr, with respect, you shouldn't um, draw an adverse inference against the minister merely because um, the answers are still in preparation. Nor, should you, nor can you infer from anything I said on behalf of the minister that there is a reluctance to answer the questions. Um, I have told you that I have uh, pursued the matter with the minister. Um, I can't add to that. And I thank you for acknowledging my bona fides in the matter, but you shouldn't, Senator Carr, doubt the bona fides of Ms. Ms. Bishop either. All of us as members of parliament, either of this chamber or of the other place, acknowledge our obligations to the parliament as paramount, and those obligations will be fulfilled in due course. The question is that the motion moved by Senator Carr be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no, I think the, no the ayes have it. Um, are there any motions to take note of answers? Senator Sherry. Yes, thank you. Um, I move to take uh, note of the two answers by Senator or Minister Scullion uh, to the questions posed by the Labor opposition in question time today. Um, it is rare that I do uh, thank a minister because normally we get evasive answers, out of touch answers, um, that indicate the government's uh, age, its contempt for the parliament. But I have to say, on this occasion, um, Senator Scullion uh, was remarkably frank in his acknowledgement when he said, quote, interest rates today are higher, under this government, meaning his government, than they've ever been. And he went on and said it again. Interest rates today are higher, under the Howard government, than they've ever been. And it was a quite a remarkable admission from Minister Scullion in today's question time, because what we got at the 2004 election from the, uh, from the Howard Liberal government was a promise, quote, that they would keep interest rates at record lows. The Howard government would keep interest rates at record lows. And today we have 
a remarkably frank admission from Minister Scullion, uh, Senator Scullion, the quote, interest rates today are higher under this government, i.e. the Howard government, than they ever have been. And this just goes to make the point that Labor uh, has been referring to uh, on many occasions since the last election. Um, we've had five interest rate increases since the last election. We've had nine interest rate increases in a row. And to really rub salt into the wound uh, of uh, many Australian, struggling Australian um, uh, Australians who are paying not just hi higher home interest rates but also credit cards in particular, um, is that interest, rates, uh, interest rate increases after the last increase by the Reserve Bank um, by some providers have been above the, the quarter point increase that occurred. They've been above um, that last quarter percent uh, increase. There's a number of complex reasons for that, but, but it does highlight the ineffective and indeed false promise made by Prime Minister, the Prime Minister, Mr Howard, at the last election that the Liberal government, a Howard government, would keep interest rates at record lows. And of course, this has had um, the, f the fact that Minister Senator Scullion today admitted that interest rates today are the highest under this government than they've ever been. Um, the, the, today he could actually admit that um, is, is uh, not of great uh, consolation to Australian families who are battling under these higher interest rates because the nine interest rate hikes in a row under this government have added some $457 a month to a $300,000 mortgage. They've added $457 a month to a $300,000 mortgage. And this is what uh, the Prime Minister, Mr Howard, meant uh, apparently when he said he'd keep interest rates at record lows. You'd get an increase of $457 a month on your mortgage. That, that's the uh, outcome of the promise, the solemn promise made by Mr Howard at the last election that uh, he, leading this government, an out-of-touch government, a stale government, um, that uh, he would keep interest rates at a record at record lows. I mean, it was one of those tricky promises that we are so used to from Mr. Howard. Another one of the tricky, disposable promises. You know, say anything, do anything to get you through an election campaign. Say anything and do anything. Well, I, I must say, I think there are some good signs that the Australian public are starting to see through some of the trickiness of the Prime Minister. I'll be interested to see whether the uh, current Treasurer, Mr Costello, can see through the trickiness of the promise, the cobbled together uh, promise that um, was given last week. L2. Yeah, L2. Um, we've now got a, a, a two-person leadership team. We can forget about the National Party, of course, the Howard Vale government, it's the Howard Costello oh, government. Um, I notice uh, Senator McGowan, the former National Party senator, nodding furiously. We can forget about the, the National Party smirking about it too. It's even better. Um, but um, Nine interest rate hikes in a row. That's hardly an example of keeping interest rates low. And of course, it's not just interest rates on, on a housing loan, credit card interest rates. I mean, so many Australians today are dependent on uh, uh, using their credit card because they're under significant economic pressure. They're paying more for childcare, more for fruit and vegetables, more for health care, more for petrol, more on interest rates, pouring greater and greater pressure on Australians um, through higher interest rates and their credit card use. And of course, we've had the industrial, the so-called work choices, which has uh, cut the wages and conditions of workers, particularly in areas like the hospitality and retail. Senator Sherry, industry. your time has expired. Senator Fear of Andy Wells. Deputy President, yes, thank you, Senator Sherry. But uh, if you want to look at why new home ownership is fast becoming the diminishing Australian dream for many people, perhaps you should go and ask your state well, Labor yeah, colleagues. Yeah, yeah. The stubborn refusal of state and territory governments to release enough land for new homes is forcing the price of house and land packages beyond the means of many hardworking Australians. It is a problem that can be tackled, and I think that um, uh, even uh, going back a bit in history, but of course, uh, you know, they might say it, but they don't actually act on it. And uh, even one of your former housing uh, spokesmen, uh, Mr. Mellon, um, said we need to increase the availability of affordable land for the construction of new housing. 
Yes, of course, it's a no-brainer. Thank you, Senator Cormann. In, um, and, and I would take the Senate back to 19, in 2006, when the uh, Reserve Bank Governor Ian McFarlane told the parliamentary committee that the decline of new home affordability was all about house prices. And I'd like to quote what he said then, because it's very much still the situation. I think it is pretty apparent now that reluctance to release new land plus the new approach whereby the purchaser has to pay for all the services up front, the sewerage, the roads, the footpaths and all that sort of stuff, has enormously increased the price of new entry-level home, Mr McFarlane said. If you want any further evidence, consider this disturbing fact. The price of land in Sydney between 1973 and 2003 rose by 700 per cent while the cost of the housing component of house and land packages has increased by just 4 per cent over the same period. Now, that is absolutely shocking. Labor, it is shameless the way Labor continue to protect their mates in the states and territories by blaming interest rates. This could not be further from the truth. Interest rates have averaged 12. Uh, averaged 12.75 per cent during Labor's 13 years in government, compared to the low rates under the coalition. I mean, have we forgotten 17 per cent interest rates? How many people had to sell their homes when interest rates were at 17, 17 per cent? Yes, absolutely, Senator. Yes, interest rates are part of the equation, and the Howard government will always strive to maintain economic settings to keep interest rates low. The decline in affordability is further accelerated by the array of state taxes and charges. The act of paying for a new home is just the tip of iceberg when it comes to, to the costs that are faced by new home buyers. Families are hit by a raft of property taxes, stamp duties, infrastructure levies and other development costs levied by state and territory governments, all on top of the purchase price. I think it is time that Labor, state and territory governments abandon the ill-conceived notion of urban consolidation, a byword which has now become um, fact for loading more people onto existing services loading more people onto existing services and removing the financial shackles from new home buyers can I, and why would they of course we don't have um, we don't have the powers to drop state taxes the only people who can compel the state labor governments to drop their state ta ta taxes are their own voters we can't make the New South Wales government, we can't make the Western Australian government reduce stamp duties. Uh, they get an absolute bonanza out of state duty in New South Wales. So if those opposite really were concerned about housing affordability, perhaps they ought to uh, impose on their state counterparts to look at the price of land, uh, at, to look at the raft of taxes, the stamp duty and, more importantly, the supply of land. That's, in the end, what is causing it simple. If you restrict supply, the price goes up. So it's all very well for those opposite to bleat, but uh, why don't they take some time, why don't they take some effort and, and try and get their state counterparts to actually do something about this and not just talk about it? Senator Marshall. Uh, thank you, Mr Deputy President. Well, today, in, in uh, the answer to questions from the opposition about the cost of living and housing affordability, we saw again another demonstration about how out of touch this government is. Uh, Minister Scullion today, um, in answering the question, went straight to the point um, which we've been making for some time, that the government has failed to keep its promise of keeping interest ra rates at record lows. We've now had five interest rate increases since the last election, where they made that dishonest promise to the Australian people. And of course, it is a ninth interest rate rise in a row. Hardly a, a government that has a strong record in this area. And of course, they then go on and tell the other mistruth 
about interest rate rises. They say they'll always be lower under a coalition government than they will be under a Labor government. But oops, Mr Deputy President, they forgot when Mr Howard was indeed Treasurer in 1982 when interest rates were in fact 22 per cent. Oops, they always seem to forget that matter. The highest interest rates have ever been in this country. And who was Treasurer at that time? Mr Howard. So it puts a lie, an absolute lie to the claim that interest rates will always be higher um, under a Labor government than a coalition government, because it is simply not true. What this government went to the last election to was just simply a dishonest election ploy as part of a scare campaign. And in this election, we'll see another scare campaign. This is what this government does. They will try to confuse people Consumer with. Confidence with is at its highest. I beg your pardon. Consumer Consumer well, now we hear, um, and now we're hearing from uh, the ex-National Party Senator, Mr. McGurran, or Senator McGurran, talking about uh, economic policy. Well, um, what an extraordinary, what an extraordinary example that is! The psycho babble that we normally hear from the National Party, he's brought over the, to the Liberal Party, and it just uh, keeps going. Now. It didn't take Senator Scullion or Minister Scullion very long, and we just heard uh, Senator Ferravanti Wells again uh, move straight to the position of blaming the states for problems about housing affordability and the, the growing and increasing pressure that all Australians are under. Uh, under this government's policies, uh, straight into blaming the states. No answers themselves, no policy position themselves. And of course, when interest rates were in fact lower, they wanted to take all the credit, all the credit for the way the economy was going, all the credit. But as they get to their fifth or their ninth interest rate increase in a row, the fifth increase under this government since they made that failed and dishonest promise in the last election campaign, it's everyone else's problem. Well, they want to take all the credit at one stage. Now it's everyone else's problem. And how, how often do we hear from this government that it's always the states? We've always got to blame the states. When things aren't going well, when the levers of the economy at the national level aren't working the way they set out, well, it must be the states' problem. It's got to be the states' problem. But we never hear them actually say when, when, the, when things go well, it's actually part of the states' problem. Like with, and uh, I think it was Senator Brandis today actually acknowledged how um, the employment or the, the reduction in unemployment had in fact been happening since prior to the election, well prior to the election of this government. It has been trending downwards um, since 1993, clearly um, trending downwards since 1993. Are they going to blame the states for that? Blaming the states for that? No, this government, of course, will take all the credit for that, even though in many instances it is the states with their policies of manufacturing development, um, economic growth that contribute to that. And of course, the complete lie is put to this argument time and time again. Mr Deputy President, the Prime Minister John Howard must have been mocking Australians when he said and claimed in the other place that working families have never been better off. He must have been mocking those Australian workers and Australian families, saying they've never been better off when family budgets are under pressure from all sides. Childcare costs, petrol costs, grocery costs, rising mortgages and the inability of many families to meet their mortgage repayments. Ten years ago, the average home cost about four times the average annual wage. Today, it costs about seven times the annual average wage. Prime Minister Howard mocks Australian workers. He's completely out of touch. He mocked Australian families when he claims that working families have never been better off. This Senator is just Marshall, simply another— Senator your time has expired. Senator Barnett. Mr uh, Deputy President, I stand to take note of answers uh, to those uh, questions that have been given by the government ministers on this side, uh, particularly with respect to interest rates, housing affordability and the future for small business in this country. Uh, the Labor senators have been waxing lyrical on the other side and uh, talking about the fact that, uh, that Mr Howard, as Prime Minister, is anti-families. Nothing could be further from the truth. The reason that uh, this government has been so successful over so many years, in fact 11 and a half years, is that this is a government for families. This government has showed passion, compassion, care and support 
for families throughout Australia, not only in the big cities but in the rural and regional parts of Australia, including in my home state of Tasmania. Now, it's very clear to me, it's in fact quite obvious to me, that the Labor senators have become very, very cocky. They've become very, very cocky on the back of some uh, recent polling. And they have acting as though they are already uh, government senators. They are very quietly and sneakily uh, acting um, and strategising to ensure that uh, some of their policies uh, come to fruition. And the only way I want to say, Mr. Deputy President, the only way that the goods and services tax in this country can increase is as a result of wallpaper Labor governments in the states and territories and at a federal level. The only way the GST can go up in Australia, that 10 per cent GST, is as a result of a, a, a Rudd Labor government being elected. So I just throw out the warning to the Australian people and to those in this chamber that uh, I see the Labor senators are being very cocky. They are sneakily going around strategising on how they can uh, quietly and sneakily bring this uh, GST uh, into, uh, into fruition. If they, if they do gain government, and that's, a, that's something that I'm very worried about. I'm very concerned about, and uh, Senator Campbell, I'm, I'm extremely concerned about it. You might deny it, but that's the only way that that can happen under a Rudd Labor government. Sen Senator George when you Campbell. have wallpaper Labor governments all Senator around Barnett, this government, address, address all around this country. Address your comments to the chair, Senator George Campbell. You, Mr. you haven't got the call, Mr. Senator Deputy uh, President. I thank you. Uh, for that uh, and bringing uh, uh, the attention of the Senate to that very important matter. And that's a concern I have, and I'm going to continue to highlight those concerns in the lead up to the election this year, as, as I will uh, with respect to interest rates. This is a very important matter. In fact, uh, 1989, 1989 was when we had 18 per cent interest rates under the Labor government. 18 per cent. Now, for small business in this country of 1.2 million small businesses in my home state of Tasmania, over 34,000 small businesses, this could be crucial. This will be critical. I know what uh, the small businesses, the farmers and their overdrafts, the interest rates they were paying on their overdrafts in and around that time, um, because I was there at the time and I was aware of it and I was concerned for my colleague uh, small businesses. And this is a government that is for small business. That's the Howard Costello team and the, uh, the team that's leading Australia, and that is uh, we are very much pro small business. Under Labor, they're going to get more red tape, and I can assure the, those in this chamber that the interest rates under our coalition government will always be lower than they are under, under a Labor government. Now, the, the records there, the, the interest rates are higher under a Labor government. So you've seen the averages, and I refer to the mortgage interest rates are still more than two percentage points lower than their March 1996 levels of 10.5 per cent. And the average new mortgage of $245,000, this reduction in interest rates saves households $449 a month in interest uh, payments. And this is the figure that, uh, that uh, Senator Gavin Marshall was referring to in terms of the increase. Um, over the last 11 years, but he, he did not refer to the average uh, new mortgage and the reduction in interest uh, uh, rate saving households $450 a month in interest payments since March 1996. That's a great result for Australian families. And uh, I want to thank uh, Mr Howden. In fact, uh, to the Treasurer, Peter Costello, who's the finest Treasurer Australia has ever had, ever had and in fact one of the finest treasurers in the world today. And I think that's recognised uh, very broadly um, in many quarters around the world, not only in the AEC, OECD countries. And uh, that should be acknowledged. In terms of, uh, and to, final, to finally say, I just wanted to say, in terms of the Rudd Labor government and the Rudd opposition at the moment, um, it's a policy black hole. There's a black hole on their website with respect to tax, with respect to transport. It's a policy black hole. It's a Me Tooism response. They're superficial in terms of uh, their policy development. There's no substance to it, and it's a complete contrast to the Howard Costello team. Se Senator, Senator Hurley. 
thank you, Mr Deputy President. I also wish to take note of the answers made by Minister Scullion um, during question time. Um, it's, uh, the Liberal Party are obviously running very scared at the moment. Uh, Senator Barnett refers to the GST and raises the, the scare tactic, which he assures us he will repeat, about um, Labor, state uh, and federal government raising the GST. I, I really don't think that the Liberal Party should talk too much about um, the GST, because it might remind people that on top of the cost of living pressures that they have, 10 per cent of every bill that they pay goes to GST, 10 per cent of every item apart from fresh food that they pay um, goes to GST. So the Labor Party has no intention of increasing the GST because we understand the kind of cost pressures that households are facing. With, um, uh, with the high prices today, with the increase in price today. And the Labor Party, understanding that, has no intention of adding to those uh, cost of living pressures. The, the pressures that in the past year alone have seen rents rise by 5.2 per cent, education costs up 4.3 per cent, health costs 4.1 per cent and housing costs 3.6 per cent. We know that they are the kind of pressures faced by working families today. This Liberal government is so out of touch with that reality that they go off into flights of fancy about, um, about, uh, all ki uh, about how families have never been um, better off uh, than they are under this government. Well, we know that that is absolute nonsense, that families are really suffering with the uh, cost of living pressures, cost suffering with housing pressures, struggling to make ends meet. Now, the minister responds with uh, talk about um, uh, reduced um, unemployment levels under this government. And it is true that unemployment uh, levels have been reduced. What is also true is during the, this current term of government, the government introduced work choices, which makes um, those jobs far more precarious than they have ever been. Work choices has, um, has made overtime rates a much more precarious proposition, have made um, uh, casual work um, much more common, have, forced, have, have the prospect of forcing wages down um, for those workers so that they can't afford to, live, to, to meet those, um, those kind of increases in costs that we were talking about. And far from allowing a, a job allowing people these days to buy houses, what it means is that they are they're unable to, to, uh, to be certain that their wage will meet um, those increased mortgage payments. And um, the, uh, the, uh, the government uh, challenges us to produce policies in response to that. Well, um, uh, Mr Kevin Rudd, uh, the leader of the Labor Party, has produced uh, policies in response to that. To that. He, has, um, he has said he would appoint a petrol commissioner to monitor and investigate petrol price gouging and collusion. Uh, he, has, uh, he, would, he has said he would direct the ACC to monitor grocery prices and publish a periodic survey of price movements. He has said he would instigate a public inquiry into grocery prices to get a better understanding of what is driving up prices. And he will expand Labor's price watch to survey supermarket prices and publish them on a website. So it, this is the Labor Party saying that they understand the pressures that, um, that uh, families are face, facing. They also understand housing pressures. And rather than whinge um, about the states not responding, they have done something about it. And um, Mr Rudd at the Housing um, Forum and later uh, in Adelaide um, at the press club lunch that I attended produced policies in response to that. He has talked about a national affordable housing agreement in conjunction with the state government. He has talked about Labor's affordable affordability fund for housing, which would look at infrastructure and reduce the amount uh, that it costs to buy land and to pr produce housing around Australia, a fund that will help up to 50,000 families buying their first home. So, uh, the Labor Party is looking at practical measures to help families. This government is so out of touch 
that it's lost um, lost any contact with the kind of reality that uh, the Senator members Hurley, of the Labor Party understand very expired. well. The question is that the motion moved by Senator Sherry be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. I think the ayes have it. Ayes have it.